Okay, so basically last week uh, we talked, we started off in Romans chapter 7, and you can put that up there for me if you don't mind. I'm using the King James on that particular scripture. Romans chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. We really kind of broke this down pretty deeply Sunday morning, um, but I had a few different scriptures from last Wednesday and, and some concepts that I wanted to, to finish up with tonight. But uh, in Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 3, 23, the word of God says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And so we talked about several different concepts last week. And we talked about the in verse 22 when it says, of the light and the law of God after the inward man. The idea here is, is that when a person becomes a born again believer, the, the Holy Spirit moves on the inside of the believer. And the word of God says in Jeremiah 31 that, that God was going to write the law of God on the heart of his people in the new covenant. And then in Ezekiel 36, it talks about the fact that the spirit of God was going to move into the heart of man. It also says that in first Corinthians six, we've been talking about that one a lot, but in John 14, he said, you know, him talking about the Holy spirit for he's been with you, but he will be in you. And so when a believer comes to faith in Christ, that the, the law of God now becomes written on his heart. The word of God becomes written on his heart because the Holy Holy Spirit now is living on the inside of the believer. Amen. And so it's very important that we understand and, and I cannot get it out of my heart or out of my mind, especially when I go to the jail, because I don't really know these people, but this should also be preached in churches. Listen, we cannot take for granted the importance of being a true convert into the faith. Amen. And what I mean by that is, is that if a person truly repents of their sin and calls out upon the Lord from their heart, you believe in their heart and confesses with their mouth that God's plan is Jesus and that they're a sinner and that they're undone and that they need a savior and they'll ask for forgiveness and they'll reach out and they'll ask the Lord <laughs> to, to save them. Amen. That the Holy Spirit will move in to the inside of their heart and, and their life will never be the same. Amen. And that is so important that, that and you know, I preached that recently that it's God's will that there be true conversions. Like not not just people thinking that they're saved, but it's so important that people really do have an opportunity to hear the truth of the gospel and to understand that there is a difference between going through the motions and truly giving your heart to God and yielding your life to God. Amen. But when that happens, praise God, the believer will delight in the law or the word of God yeah. on the inward part. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. Right. But then he says, I see another law in my members and it's warring against the law of my mind. And so the battle we talked about this last week is in the mind. Because, see, even though our spirit is saved, and listen, it's important for us to understand that the Thessalonian letter says this, that it's God's will that we be sanctified wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, the whole man be sanctified, your soul, your body, your spirit, it's God's will that the work be done on the whole man. See, God wants not just our spirit to be intertwined with the Holy Spirit, but he wants the spirit of God to begin to have its way in our our soulish man, like we talked about Sunday, to where it begins to affect our mind and we begin to operate with the mind of Christ, that our mind would be renewed. And as we operate with the mind of Christ, it's going to begin to affect our will and our will is going to begin to line up with the will of the Father. And then hallelujah, I'm telling you right now, it'll start setting our emotions right. Yes. It'll start getting our emotions right. We won't have to walk around under a spirit of depression if we begin to learn how to yield to the will of God. I'm sorry. I believe that. Yes. I'm in the medical. I'm in medical. The, uh, you know, I'm a nurse practitioner too. I believe that if we will yield to the will of God, to the word of God, and that we will, we will allow the Holy Spirit spirit to speak to our man that our mind would be renewed according to the word of God that the Holy Spirit will begin to minister to our soul and that our mind will begin to line up according to the word of God. I believe that. There's an attack on your mind, Christian. I just want you to know that. 
The enemy wants to attack your mind. And he wants to get you to start believing the storm, the circumstance, the situation. He wants you to start believing everything you see going on around you. Trust me, I know that. He went, look, in the job place, he wants to cause havoc, right? In your finances, he wants to cause trouble sometimes. In your cars, right? All the transmission again. Look, for the first three years of my now you can say it's because I kept buying like old used cars. I get it. That's right. But if I didn't, if it wasn't the, the blowing a head gasket, it was blowing the transmission. I, I must have blown five different transmissions and three different head gaskets within the first three years of Christianity. And every time I turned around, it was more car trouble. You know? And, and listen, the enemy will begin to attack and, and look, we just got to get to the point where we're like, we got to have enough of this. Anyway, that was a, no, but he'll attack you in your family. He'll attack you with your children. He'll attack you. He'll, he's not going to quit attacking. Now, if we get complacent and we play church, then he calms down a little bit. I'm just going to be real with you. He calms down a little bit when we play church, but I'm telling you right now, we'll let the Holy Spirit get a hold of us and we get set on fire and we'll start stepping outside the walls of this church and we'll start speaking Jesus in the street and speaking Jesus to our friends and speaking Jesus every chance that we get to somebody that's hurting out there and we'll start getting listen the enemy going to get stirred up he gets like a hornet's nest and he gets mad but he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world and we don't have to live in fear to like they used to call him in the old church old slew foot we don't have to live in fear to that old goat hoofed uh, lion fallen angel amen because we have victory in Christ praise God but, but that's what it'll do. It'll, it'll law against the of your mind and it'll try to bring you into captivity to the law of sin, which is in your members. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants us to get into our flesh. He wants to bring it. He wants to bring it from our, from our mind and our soul. And he wants to disturb our spirit, but he ultimately wants to get it to be manifested in our flesh in the physical realm. The way that we talk to people, the way that we behave, the things that we do, that's really what he wants to do. He wants to grab a hold of our, our and make us do that. So we talk about these laws because these are spiritual laws, right? Uh, and in our world, laws carry weight, right? Um, spirit, spirit, laws carry weight in the real world, but I need you to understand that these spiritual laws also have meaning. We got into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, and... I want, let's go ahead and take a look at that particular passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. We talked a little bit because, you know, we kind of transitioned. We st spent a good bit of time on the, on the mind, but in this particular passage right here, it says right here, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. And so the word spiritual has the word pneuma in it. I told y'all about that last week. I drew it on the board. Pneumatikos, which pneuma is where we get the word pneumatics because the spirit is connected to air or wind, right? Um, but but and so he says, you're not, you're not a pneumatikos. You, you weren't spiritual. You're, you're not, he said to the church in Corinth, which is really kind of interesting if you, if you really think about it, because, and listen, I did a teaching on this for earlier in the last year, but it's kind of, it's kind of amazing because us as Pentecostals and Charismatics, we're, we're so focused on the church of Corinth because the apostle Paul said that he said, you come behind no one in gifts. Like he says that in chapter one, hey, nobody got the gifts like you got my friend. You are really flowing in the gifts. But then if you really read the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then 1 Corinthians 14, what you see is it's actually a rebuke. Yes. It's actually a rebuke to the church of Corinth because they're actually being rude. And then if you really start digging in the church of Corinth when they were supposed to be having communion, and then the rich folk is what I can understand in my studies. The rich folk said, hey, we're going we're gonna to meet here at really like five-ish, okay? But we're going to tell all them other people six. And by the time all the common folk showed up, all the bread was gone and the wine was gone. And Paul's like, don't you have houses that you can eat in? How would you feel if, if you were like, no, really, man. Look, we're all level at the foot of the cross. We're not supposed to be treating brothers and sisters yeah, in the Lord like that. Lord, help us. 
Paul. But listen, this is the church. I didn't mean to get off on that, but I want you to understand. And you know what? I think that the Lord is concerned about fruit. You can operate in all the gifts you want, but if you got a bunch of gifts and you don't have no fruit, I'm not real sure yes. that the Lord, Lord is real pleased with that. Yeah. The Lord wants Christians operating in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, temperance. But everybody wants to see, everybody wants to see the gifts. Give us the gifts. Pray that, yeah. But you know what? Jesus said this. He did. It wasn't me. I didn't coin this. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a son. Oh, we want signs and wonders, praise God. We want signs and wonders. We want gifts. We want miracles. We want to see healings. Praise God. The Holy Spirit is a healer. But, but listen, we want the truth, and we want the, the truth will produce fruit in your life. I want yes. you to know that. The truth of the gospel, if you, will, if you will hold on to the truth, and you'll chew on it, and you'll let it resonate and sink down inside of your spirit, and you'll meditate on the truth of what the Word of God is saying, it will begin to produce fruit in your life. Praise God. And, and so in the letter to the Corinthian church, though, right here, he straight up tells them, brethren, I could not speak to you as though you were spiritual, but instead carnal. And, other, and the word carnal there is sarkikos, which is the word for flesh. Let's just not get it too fancy here. One, you're spiritual. The other one, you're fleshly. So, so you, I, I would have preferred to speak to you in spiritual concepts, but I couldn't. He said, and he goes on to say this, really, not only were you fleshly, but you were like a babe in Christ. And he said, I fed you with milk. Now, I do not believe, I don't even know why I'm saying this. I don't know if it's necessary because some of you have really been reading your Bible. So I feel like since some of you are really reading your Bibles, you're going to run across it when you get into the P Peter's letters. And you're going to see where, where Peter says, crave the spiritual milk. That, that's two different concepts. See, a baby, listen, babies need milk, milk. They need nourishment. And the reality of it is, is that we don't need just meat. We need milk. We don't need just milk. We also need meat. Amen. And don't, so don't, let's not think that milk is a bad thing, but we're supposed to also have a desire for the meatier things of God. Amen. And, but, but listen, a true believer is going to crave the word of God like a baby craves milk because that baby got to have milk. He's got to have calories. He's got to have nutrition because he's growing at such a rapid rate. All right. So I just wanted to point that out, but he says, I fed you with milk, not with meat in verse two, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. And he says it again. He says, for you are carnal. For whereas, and this is the part that I want you to, I want you to think with me because I don't know that I've ever thought about this exactly like this. All right. So I'm just telling you right now, I, this thought right here has never completely crossed my mind. And so I'm about to say it to you and your thinkers for yourself. I'm not asking you to believe whatever the case. I'm trying to provoke your thoughts. All right. Because we're already talking about the fact that you have a physical body. You are a, you, you are a spirit. We talked about that in the last two services. That means you're, you're an eternal being. Amen. That means you're not going to die. God is a spirit. You're a spirit. That's a good word right there for people that are born again and saved. Amen. Because that means you're going you're gonna to get an upgrade. You're going to live in eternity with God. Amen. That's good. Praise God. And not so good for those that are going to die without the Lord. Because, see, that's eternal separation. All right. But, but anyway, you're an, so you're a spirit and you have a soul. You have a mind, a will, and emotions, and it makes you a distinct individual. John is John, the two Johns, y'all are both Johns, and y'all both are different, right? And, and Matt is Matt, and Gaudenzio Munez is Gaudenzio, ain't no, but one Gaudenzio Munez in the world, okay? And, and, and so you are a distinct personality, all right? And, and, you're, and you're encased in this physical flesh that you engage your external world with because God created a physical world and he created physical beings and you and I engage this physical world. But what I wanted to, what I wanted to say is this, is that he said in verse 14, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It says right here, he says, but the natural man, now, this was different. This wasn't sarkikos, which is fleshly. This wasn't pneumatikos, which is spiritual. This was sukikos or psychikos, where we get the word psyche, 
Okay, the word soul is where we get the word psyche. I think that's interesting to me. Yeah. That's just so interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we don't have time to get into that right now. Verse 14, but the psychological, the soulish man, the soul man, okay, receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I made a point last time, and maybe whenever I preach Sunday, that the soulish part of the man, like that you could be saved, but you could be operating from your soul. Meaning what you think, what you want, and what you feel, not listening to the Spirit of God like you're supposed to. And instead of the Spirit of God leading the way, instead what you think, what you want, what you feel. I don't have to go ahead and give you a whole bunch of specificities, do I? There's so many different things in our life each and every day where we have our own opinions about things. Come on, somebody, help me out. And sometimes we're all willing to admit that our opinions are right, right? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes we're all willing, uh, willing to admit that sometimes our opinions are wrong, yeah. right? right? Surely I can get you to nod your head to that. That's right, preacher. You're right. Sometimes my opinions are right, and when they're right, that's when I really want you to listen to me. And sometimes my opinions are wrong. And so that means that you're not a perfect creation. You were created perfect. Mankind, anyway, let me get into that. You, but because of the fall, right. our mind needs to be renewed right. to where we come to the place where we receive the mind of Christ. And many times, as the natural man, even though we're believers, the natural man, that soulless part, that mind, can begin to quash the leading of the Holy Spirit and then we make choices based on our soul. And when we make those choices based on our soul and things don't turn out the way we expected, man, then we're just like, we want to blame God. And it wasn't God's fault. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Help me. I'm preaching amen. better than your amen. And I'm amen. telling you right now, because most of the time people are not really yielding to the spirit of God many times. Amen. We're not yielding to the spirit of God, but we all want to change people in this church. We're not wanting to continue to live that way. Amen. We want to learn how to yield to the Holy Spirit. Amen. To hear the voice of God. And the biggest part of that, I have to tell you in the new covenant is that we learn to die to self. Yeah. That's the whole concept of where the message of the cross isn't just for salvation, but it's also for daily living. That we learn to die to self based on faith in what the Christ has already done. And that whenever the Lord through his word reveals through his spirit the things in your life that God's not pleased with. Then you communion, you go into communion with the Holy Ghost and you let him have your, his way with you. And you say, and it don't have to be at the altar in the church. It's a nice thing whenever you do that from time to time. Because sometimes when you do it in public, something sticks. But it doesn't have to be that way. Listen, it can be in your bedroom. Amen. On the side of your bed. Praise God, at least you're doing it. As a matter of fact, some of my best repentance sessions have been on the side of my bed. Or in my living room when I'm worshiping the Lord. Amen. And but, the, but the point is, is to let the Holy Spirit have his way. Amen. Praise God. So what I, wanted to, what I wanted to tell you that I've never seen completely before is, is that when I'm looking at this, the Spirit in me. The Holy Spirit in me is speaking to my spirit. And the Holy Spirit saying to Matt's spirit, son, you have to yield to me, right? And I need you to let your mind know to tell your will which way I need you to go. Okay, and, and then it's going to affect your body to get you moving into the right direction. Amen. But you know what I was wondering is about the flesh. See, sometimes it might just be in our soulish realm, right? And this is just a thought in our soulish realm where, where Matt's mindset, I think something, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a person. I'm really more the pastor of the church. Um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, okay. Let's just say, let's use this example. I go visit another church or I'm a, let's just say I'm not the pastor. I'm, I'm in a church and, and, and I'll say, um, there's three different there's three different preachers or four different preachers. 
and I'm and I'm not really making this up. It's actually in the text. <laughs> that, that's just the best example I can find. And it's kind of like, man, I, I really like the way old boy preaches, to be honest with you. I mean, I just wish that they let him have the mic more often because such and such, he just didn't really do it for me. You're right. And then, and then somebody else would say, but I really like the way this one preaches. And then somebody else says, but I really like the way this one over here preaches. But the interesting thing is, is that they're actually all preaching the same message. Praise God. Hopefully they're all yeah. preaching the same message. Amen. But they just have different styles. And I get that. I mean, there's some I like teachers. More than not, although some preachers lately I've been watching, I'm like, oh, that brother got so fire in him, right? But but I tend to like teachers. That tends to be what, what I like. Not everybody's like that, right? But so what I'm trying to say, though, is, is that it's one thing to have an opinion. And there's nothing wrong with having an opinion. You just happen to like somebody better. But... You can, if you're not careful, your opinion can be so strong that your mindset towards that other brother, even though he's over there pouring himself out for the kingdom of God, is like, yeah, I don't really, I don't have much for him, right? And well, that's still in your soulish realm yeah. because you're just thinking it. It's not really the spirit of God because the spirit of God probably might be very happy with that brother. Right? Because that brother, he's like, no, I'm, I'm over here doing it. I'm, I'm preaching the truth. Amen. My, my message is what God wants me to preach. And, and, and I've noticed that whenever somebody's preaching the truth, I'm just like excited. And sometimes I get more excited to watch and hear other people preach the truth than whenever I get an opportunity to preach the truth. I'm just telling you like, man, that brother's preaching. Hallelujah. Listen to the truth that they're speaking. Praise God. You know, but there's been times that I sat in churches, and I've shared this before, and I thought, that's why I could preach on this, I thought to myself, I could do better than that. And, and in reality, I couldn't, because that person was actually a better preacher than I was. But I thought it in my mind, I could do better than so what I'm trying to say is I still haven't gotten to my point yet. I'm sorry for that. I take a long time sometimes to get to my points. It's still in my mind at that point. But when I release it, and I say, what do you think about Apollos? I mean, I know that he had a whole lot of knowledge, but he just don't seem like he's, you know, I really like it when Peter preaches. When Cephas preaches, man, it rocks the house. He used to walk with the Lord, bruh. I know that little rock got something going. And then, but you know, little old Paul, man, he sometimes got that crust up in his eyes and he's kind of short. And, you know, and he just sits there and he just talks to us in such a way. Like, he's, you know, he's like, you're going to know it whenever I show up because I'm going to tell you like it is. And, and it, you know, but at first it was just in my mind. But then when I started to release it into the crowd, one of the things that he said right here, for you are carnal, for whereas there is among you, you envying and strife and divisions are you not fleshly and you're walking as men so it's one problem to have a mindset that is against what the spirit of God would be saying but you're taking it to a whole other level when you begin to release it out of your mouth into the physical realm that you live in or whenever you start to use your members and you begin to engage now you're operating in the flesh that's what he said. He, sh he showed us the distinction between the soulless man, the spiritual man, and the fleshly man. So part of it, when we say walking in the flesh versus walking in the spirit, is not just what I have the object of my faith in, although it is a very important part. If the object of my faith is properly placed in what Christ has done for me, then now I'm being crucified. My flesh is being crucified. My mind is being renewed according to the truth of God's word. And now the words that I begin to speak are encouraging it to someone because they're being used by God or, I'm, or the Lord would use me to exhort and to encourage instead of to tear down, to bring division, but instead to bring unity, amen, and to encourage the body of Christ. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. So let's take a look at Ephesians a little bit because what we're talking about is that the mind need some help. Amen. The mind is the Amen. the mind is the is the place that we need the Lord to do the work. And so we're going to take a look at Ephesians uh, 
chapter 4 and um, Ephesians chapter 4. And, and look, I don't know that I'm going to go through the whole chapter because I really want to just get us to verse 20. But let's start in verse 1. Um, and we'll start reading right there. The Apostle Paul says, therefore, the, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. And I mean, in that, so does that ever convict you? <laughs> Sometimes like when I'm just reading the word of God and I see that and he says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. I just get convicted because it's like this brother's in prison and I'm over here living in America and I'm already convicted because he's over here writing a letter telling Christians how they should be acting. Right. And I know sometimes I don't act right. And so I'm already convicted. But anyway, I don't know about you. That's just me. Uh, there, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I'm begging you, that you would walk worthy of the vocation. Mo uh, other translations use the word calling, that you would walk worthy of the calling wherewith you were called. And this is what it looks like to work, to walk worthy, that you would walk with lowliness, meekness, with long suffering, and that you would forbear one another in love. This was the part that really stuck out to me, though, in verse three, where it said this, that you would endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace that you would keep. OK, that word right there talks about guarding to keep the eye on. The, the Apostle Paul is encouraging the believers in Ephesus, listen, you need to keep your eye on this and you need to walk with lowliness and you must endeavor to protect the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The Holy Spirit wants to hold the body of Christ together yes. and teach us amen to amen. be in unity and to walk as one praise God all right let's just keep going a little bit more he says this there is one body he, Jesus ain't got a bunch of bodies he's got one body now I'm going to be honest with you I have to tell you that it's, it's going to be hard for me to fellowship with some sects s-e-c-t-s that call themselves Christian because some of their their beliefs I, I, I don't I don't know that I completely really agree with them but I'm going to tell you at the same time the Holy Spirit is definitely dealing with me to walk in unity with other brothers that are like-minded in the faith even if they don't know everything or believe everything about sanctification the way I do if they believe that Jesus is the Son of God if they believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead if they believe in the Holy Ghost the way I believe in the Holy Ghost if they believe hallelujah I want to be able to rub shoulders with them. I want to be able to believe with them because it's time for us to start partnering with some other believers and for us to start praying and to, start to get together in unity because this world is going crazy and this nation is going crazy and it's not going to be fixed in a voting booth, my friend. And what? And the bullets aren't going to fix it either. Yes, yes. It's going to be fixed. And we need to get in the prayer closet. We're going to need to learn how to pray men and women of God. We're going to need to learn how to get a hold of the Lord. But listen to me, man. The days are growing dark. We, we Look, I know y'all heard me say it. I'm not trying to be mean. But we done got spoiled in America. Oh, yes. Lord, help us if we got invaded by China. People say, oh, no, it's not going to ever happen. You don't know what's, what's going around the corner. We better start praying. We're sitting back in our recliner, flipping through the channels. Come on, I'm not going to tell you what channel because then you get offended. I don't know what channel. I'm just saying we're sitting there flipping through the channels and we need to be praying. Lord, give us a spirit of prayer. Give us a desire. I mean, we need, I, I rebuke and bind a spirit of complacency that try to come over us and, and tell us that we're okay. No, we're not. We need, to be, we need to wake up. The Apostle Paul said, you need to be sober. You need to be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, rolls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And listen, he said, you, you got to be sober. You, we got to wake up, but spiritually sober. It doesn't mean you've been drinking beer in the back of your heart. It means, it means to be spiritually sober, to be awake. Amen? Praise God. And the Lord help us. All right. Hallelujah. 
So, so we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. That, that's the spirit is saying, would you please be unified? <laughs> Listen, if your body, we talked about this, I, I think maybe yesterday <laughs> with somebody at prayer, maybe after prayer, about the fact that, and I think Solomon said it a while back too, about the Lord, the Lord is the head. He's the head. That's the authority position, right? The mind tells the body what to do. The head is, it, 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 Jesus is wanting to tell his body what to do. Right. He wants to be in charge. Yes. And so if we have a, a collective group of believers that are being led by the spirit. And we endeavor to keep the unity of the peace as one body. Because there's one body. And we're, and we're collectively believing together and walking together. Now he can place his head upon a set of shoulders like that. And we can function as a unified organism. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be at the same place at the same time. But we're in unity and we're believing together for a greater purpose than ourselves. Which is to see people come into the kingdom of God. Which is to believe that whenever we share the seeds of the gospel that they will take root and that they will bear fruit in people's lives. And we will believe that God's spirit will be poured out upon the churches. That we will believe that God will begin to arouse the pastors that are supposed to stand behind the pulpit and to preach the truth. I don't know about you, but we need to start praying for preachers to stand up. Hallelujah. And to preach the truth. That's part of the reason that we're in the condition that we're in. Because nobody wants to tell the truth. America was built the foundation upon men of God that that proclaimed the word of God and that God blessed this nation. That's right. And we need to get back to that. That's it. Praise God. We need to have a Josiah revival. We need to start tearing the idols down out of the land. We need to start preaching the truth of the gospel. Amen. Amen. We, need, we need to get rid of these lying prophets and we need to turn them off. I'm not, you know, whatever. I'm not, we're not going to go as far as burning their bones on the altar like Josiah. He really had a reformation. But what I'm saying is, is that, I mean, we can at least turn the channel. Lord help us. All right. So he says we're going to endeavor to keep one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift. So then he goes on and he, and he explains this. He said in verse 11, he says this. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Praise God. The Lord wants the pastors and the, the apostles, the pastor, the evangelist, the, the, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher to do their job, to equip the saints, to be prepared to do the work of the ministry. God wants you and I, God wants you to do the work of the ministry. Do you know that? He, yeah. he don't want just the preacher to do That's the work right. of the ministry. That's not what it says right here. Right. He wants to get, now what does that mean? It means, it means a lot of different things. Okay. It means things in the house of God, but it really means things out there. When you see people in need, that you would be led by the Holy Spirit to help them, but that you're not just helping them with a couple of dollars, you're helping if you, you part, a couple of dollars might be part of it, a loaf of bread might be part of it, but you're giving them Jesus and you're giving them the gospel and you're giving them an opportunity the way you would do it to share the truth, to, to allow a seed to be planted, amen, on the inside of another human being. Amen. Amen. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's really what the word of God is supposed to be doing in us. Yep. It's supposed yes. to be crucifying our old man that was born of Adam. And it's supposed to, through the Holy Spirit, as we yield to the will of God, the Holy Spirit's conforming and fashioning us into the image of Christ. Where we start looking more like him and less like us. Amen? Amen. Amen. But th look at this. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But we talked about that in our little Sunday night Bible study 
about that passage of scripture right there. That you know what like tossed around on an ocean. One time I was on a going on an offshore job and I was on this boat. They were carrying us out there on the boat instead of on a helicopter, and the, <clears throat> the rudder broke. The rudder broke and the and the captain couldn't steer the boat, and we were just floating. We were just floating around and, and we and we, there was no way for us to get where we needed to go. They had to like fly some divers out there to fix it. And and people that are under uh, under a false doctrine, that's what happens is that they 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 just float aimlessly. Like like a like a broken vessel on an ocean, the waves are just tossing them. It's not God's will for his people to to be tossed about like a like being on waves in the ocean. It's God's will that we would have a compass and that we would have direction and that we would know the truth and that we, and that we would allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Amen. Yes. And so where I wanted to really bring you is I just wanted to share some of those things. Um he goes on to say in verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I mean, isn't that, that's awesome. You need to understand that you're part of that body. And it, and it really does matter when you're not here. It really does. You know, they were talking about that on text group this today. Like, it, it really does matter. Like, whenever we don't show up, because you don't know. Sometimes just somebody seeing you here encourages people. And the Lord might give you a word of encouragement for somebody. You just don't know. Amen. It's not, you get the point. God, God wants to use us to minister. And you know, let me just say this too. I want to encourage some of you, some of you people, the Lord does give you like, words of knowledge and there's at least three or four of you in here right now that the Lord has already given you words and I just want this to be a place where you have freedom to utilize that gift amen um, please don't shrink back even if you're on the music ministry or whatever that to me is actually more important than strumming a guitar or, or even singing a lyric right then and there if the Lord gives you a word please Feel free to, to get down and to, and to get it if it's, if it's a word from the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Because that's important. I just want y'all to know that, that we want to allow the Holy Spirit to, uh, to have his way in that. All right. And so having, but he goes on to say this. So he's the head and it's working uh, about working through uh, what God is desiring to do. Amen. And so he goes on to say this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. So these are how Gentiles live their lives. They're living their lives in such a way that they're caught up in the world. They're caught up in the things of the world. But if you have learned Christ, that's not who you are. If you have learned Christ, you're not supposed to be living like the world. Amen. And, and then he goes on to the, to the renewed mind. He says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. And that's what I wanted to see because see that word renewed means to renovate and God is desiring to renovate our mind. Amen. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually make it through to this uh, particular uh, song that I wanted to play for you. It's an old song. It's called uh, Rock of Ages. Y'all ever heard of that song? Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in me. There's a particular word in this version of the song that I really like this word. Riven, R-I-V-E-N. It's old English word. It means a split. Okay, and I want you to I want you to see the uh, I want you to you're going to see it as we play the song. 
that you're going to see the word rib because it's talking about his ribbon side. Okay. But there's a reason I wanted you to see that because there's a, there's a theological concept that I wanted to, to share with you when we, when we get to that. You see, you see the words and, and you see, you see the meaning of the words, but I wanted to talk to you about that, that, that ribbon side just for a second. See, because it means split and, you know, I preached this one time a long time ago, but where the idea that God in the first Adam took a rib out of Adam and he created Adam a bride named Eve and that whenever Jesus hung on the cross and that his, his side was split, right? Whenever that, that spear, his side was riven and it was split open and from that wounded side, from that riven side flowed the blood and water, which was a double cure, right, for sin and it atoned us for sin, but it also broke the power of sin. And Chris, if you could put Romans chapter 11, verse 17 up there, because when I think of, so, so the first time God took a rib out of Adam and made him a bride, but in Christ, I see this split in his side, how it says in the scripture, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. The Gentiles were grafted in. And, and before you can graft in a branch, you have to split the branch. You understand what I'm saying? And that he and then he he grafted in a Gentile bride. I want you to know that, that the scripture describes the body of Christ as a Gentile. And that and that whenever that, that side was split. I see that in that the Lord is grafting in the Gentiles. Amen. And that now we're going to just go ahead and close with this particular verse of scripture right here. John 15, four through five. It says this, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Amen. So, so he's, he made a way for you and I to be grafted in and for us to abide in him. Amen. And when we abide in him, the Holy Spirit is flowing. It, it, it all came because of the cross. It's all because of what Jesus did at the cross that allows us to be connected to Jesus, allows us to abide in Jesus. And when we dwell there and stay there, the Holy Spirit ministers and nourishes us. Amen. And he renews our mind through that process. And he does a work on the inside of us. Amen.